Okay, so it's 10 o'clock and let's get started with the webinar. Uh, this is Ben Rosso here with Solid Applications. I'm broadcasting from the Solid Applications Cotswold Hills Regional Center of Technical Excellence, otherwise known as my home office. And I want to thank you all for coming. I see we have uh, several, I think 11 people on right now. That's really great attendance. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, this is a uh, really a, a nice thing to do and it's our first time through. So this is going to be a uh, condensed sort of training and example uh, webinar for SOLIDWORKS simulation. We're going to cover uh, very briefly the basic workflow, kind of like the world according to Ben, and then we're going to cover some detail on meshing and contacts. Uh, so our intent here is that we're going to, come on, let's go, here we go, simulation webinars. This is going to be the first in uh, a series of five so today we're doing workflow and meshing and contacts. Uh, two weeks from now, we'll be doing restraints and fixtures. Then we'll be going over a lesson on June 18th, applied forces and loads. After that, we'll be doing some working with materials and a few practical tips that I have come up with that uh, you may not see in your uh, training manuals anytime. And finally, understanding your results. So what that means is I'm gonna show you some details on what you can do with your results plots and with the other results information from your studies to make your results clearer to, to get much more uh, uh, zoned in on exactly what you want to see. So today's presentation is the uh, workflow of meshing. So the format today is going to be an ex educational presentation, otherwise known as death by PowerPoint, and then it's going to be followed by a live simulation run through on an actual model. So. Uh, the objective uh, of, for the workflow uh, section is I just want to show you a kind of a working layout of the study tree and I want you to be able to have enough background to get around comfortable within a simulation study. If, uh, if you've done simulation before, you might just pick up a few pointers that make it worth attending. For meshing and contacts, what we'd like is for, we want you to have the know how to confidently mesh a model for a study. It's been said to me that some people just aren't confident. They don't feel, they're a little nervous when they go to mesh a model. Uh, I think ultimately my plan is for you to be able to accurately mesh models with the appropriate level of detail. I don't want you to be worried about failed meshes. I want you to be able to query your mesh to make sure it's a good mesh and make the choices that you intend to make so your study isn't too large or too coarse. All right, today's topics, we're gonna to be covering uh, all this in about 45 minutes. So we're gonna start out with the basic outline of the simulation FDA workflow. Then we're gonna start going into the mesh detail. Why do I have to mesh? What kind of meshes are there? What's available in SOLIDWORKS simulation? Uh, big mesh and small mesh. We're gonna pinpoint fine detail only where you need it so you don't need a supercomputer to run your study. Good and bad meshes. What about accuracy? Are there faults? Uh, let's take a look at it. How can we figure it out? Uh, contacting. Now, contacting is interesting because contacting affects the mesh. So, how do bodies uh, touch each other or not touch each other, as the case may be? And when do I have to remesh? So, sometimes you know you made a change and a remesh has to happen. So, what criteria determine whether you need to remesh? So, we're going to start now with the simulation workflow. This is a picture of the SolidWorks simulation uh, ribbon bar, and this will show up looking like this when you actually are in a study. When you're not in a study, all you'll have over here is the new study button. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. It's a good uh, interface. Anything you can't find here, you can find in the simulation windows menu. But in fact, I find myself not gravitating towards the ribbon. It's nothing wrong with it. But what I find is that when I use the uh, study tree, it's a condensed one-stop shop. And I, my whole world works off of the right click. So... It's my preference that I'm kind of going to be showing you, but I think most people who do simulation regularly, we keep returning to the tree because all the information is there. You can see just about everything you need off of a right click. I tend to work top to bottom when I have a new study, make sure my materials are set up, my connections. You right click, click each folder for the choices that are available. So right clicking each of those folders will give you a menu. You've got your parts, you've got your connections, you got your connections, include your contacts and any uh, connectors like pipe or I any, mean, excuse me, like bolt or pin connectors, fixtures and restraints, how is the model held in place, external loads, forces, gravity, centrifugal forces, remote loads, that sort of thing. And then meshing where we dice the model into little tiny computer manageable pieces. And once you've run your study, this results folder will appear and your color plots will be in there. 
So my MO is that I work off the tree because it's one place where I can find everything I need on a, on a regular basis and I do everything off of the right click. So the work that you build up when you create a study is going to be shown in each folder. So you simply expand a folder to view its contents. Here's the parts folder for a part, a model called Mount Flange. And you can see there are several different bodies in there in different states of completion. Here's the connections folder. And under connectors, which is a subfolder, you see we have bolt group one, bolt group two. Those are virtual bolts. And below that is the contact sets. And there you can see that a couple of con no penetration contacts have been created. Here we have the fixtures folder. There's one fixture in there, a simple fix fixture, external loads, and a couple of uh, a torque and a remote load. Each of these can be expanded, like the mesh folder here, by simply clicking that little triangle when it points down, it expands, and when it points to the right, it's not expanded. So here you can see in the mesh folder, there's a mesh control. We've got a mesh quality plot. Fair enough. So each of those folders will build up content as you define your study. So I've said it before, I'm gonna say it again, right click is your friend. If you right click an item, you'll get a lot of choices. Here, the connections folder has been right clicked and this drop down menu shows up. It enables you to create a contact set or a component contact, we'll go into that, don't worry. Uh, or you can create different types of connectors, spring connectors, pin, bolt, bearing, et cetera. Uh, here's another example, the external loads folder. You can see that that, on the right click will give us a whole list of all the different ways we can put in the loads. So that's quite a list there. Each one of those has a lot of detail inside of it. So that list is, is actually a lot more extensive than it looks. Now the parts folder and the mesh folder, they show a green check when they're done. You can see right here, the mesh folder has a green check on it. So there's a parts folder, there's a green check on there, and the mesh folder has a green check on it. Now what that means is that they are at a state of completion that means that the study can be run. Now it's no big sin if you don't have the green check on there and you go to run your study. If you don't have a green check on your parts folder, you'll just get a message say one or more of your parts is not defined. If you don't have a green check on your mesh folder, if your mesh, for example, has never been created or it's out of date, then what will happen is simulation will simply run the mesher and you'll see it running and you kind of palm the forehead and oh, I forgot to mesh it again. And you know, so it's no big sin. You know, these aren't deal breakers but they do let you know that it's ready to go. Myself, I like to have my entire study set up and ready to run before I hit that run button. So now let's turn to meshing. Why do we have to mesh a model? Let's look at something really simple. This is a simple geometrical cantilever beam, your basic diving board with somebody standing on it under gravity. This is something that's simple and analytical. Any uh, engineering uh, strength and materials textbook will have an equation for this. And it's basically, let me back up one. This is what's called an analytical problem, all right? This is easily understandable. There are known equations that you find in books and they exist all over the place. But when things are curvy and complex, it's not that simple. It's not like the same equations don't apply, but they're way, way more complex. And nobody wants to solve this sort of uh, model by hand, right? So by dicing the model into tiny elements that use simpler equations, what we've done, is we've reproduced the geometry to a high degree of accuracy, and we put many, many easily uh, calculated nodes in there. Now, I say easily calculated, there might be one or two dozen uh, equations for each pair of nodes, but still, it's something that computers do well. Computers handle lots and lots of repetitious calculations very well. So a mesh is a representation of your model in tiny little chunks or elements that a computer can easily work with. That's why we have to mesh. That's great. Well, it's an element. Well, let's talk about solid elements first. They're the ones that most people think of. So there are draft quality and high quality elements. A solid draft quality element is a tetrahedron. That means it's made out of four triangular faces. It's got six straight line edges. And on the corners, there are nodes. The nodes are where the calculations actually take place. It's really good because it's economical, it's fast. The downside is that your curvature representation is a little bit faceted. Now, a high quality solid element is similar, but it's more complex. It's kind of, I call it a tetrahedron-ish shape. Uh, it's got four kind of triangular-ish sides. They're curvy, as you can see, because the edges are parabolic, they're curved. That means second order. We call that, it's a second order mesh. Now, 
in terms of the number of nodes, it's got 10 nodes. It's got the four same nodes on the corner, but it's got six additional nodes, more or less in the middle of the edges. So because the edges are curved, it handles curvature really well. When I say better curvature representation here, what I mean is, is it'll represent the curvature better. It'll also give you more accuracy, especially uh, with small curvature and with detailed fine features. So it takes more time to solve. You've got more nodes. More nodes means more equations, uh, but you get uh, more accurate results. So looking at three different types of elements, let's talk about this for a minute. We have the solid elements, which I just kind of went over as an example. These are the chunky 3D triangular pyramid-y things. Then we have shell elements. Shell elements are based upon either faces of your model or surface bodies if you do surface modeling. Uh, also, sheet metal, by default, will come into a SOLIDWORKS study as shell, will be meshed as shell. Now, you can change that if you want, again, off of the right click, but sheet metal in SOLIDWORKS automatically comes in as shell elements. So, shell elements don't have any thickness. The user applies a thickness in the dialog when setting up that shell. So, you might tell it you're three millimeters thick, and what it does is it will, it will account for the thickness, but it enables you to have a huge reduction in element count. You can put fine elements in there without, let's say, being two or three elements thick through the thickness. So if you have a large expanse, it's very thin, you don't want to have to have two elements thick throughout that region because that's a lot of elements, right? So you can have larger elements with a thickness applied to them, and it really reduces the amount of work your computer has to do. Beam elements come out of the construction industry, and they're meant for beam-type structures where you have long, skinny things of constant cross-section. The beauty of these is that they only have two nodes, one node at each end of the beam. And because the shape is constant, SOLIDWORKS simulation will look at that and it will figure out the cross-sectional properties of each of those beams, you know, like the moments of inertia, things like that. So you don't have to do all those complicated calculations, and it's a huge reduction in study size for long, uniform numbers. Now, in a SOLIDWORKS simulation study, and I mean the simulation you get with SOLIDWORKS Premium or just simulation standard, you can have mixed meshes. You can have mixed solid shell and beams. You just have to pay attention to how everything's attached to each other. That can all exist in one study. Mixed mesh, done deal, it's all covered. Okay? Now, what about what the kind of the quality of the qualitative properties of our mesh? Well, we know what a draft quality mesh looks like now. We've been over that a little bit. And you can see the faceting along the curvature here and the faceting around this hole. Uh, that's, you know, that's just an artifact of having straight edges. Sometimes it's perfectly fine. Uh, if you have a high quality solid mesh, you're going to have curvature. So each of these edges is going to be curved, literally. Now, what you're seeing here in the faceting, that's just the, uh, the level of detail that the Sol SOLIDWORKS screen is showing at the moment. Now, the level of detail in your mesh can all also go from fine, so you can tell it I want really small elements and a lot of them. What does that mean? It means big study, lots of equations to solve, but better detail. A coarse mesh, quick and dirty. You're going to run your study, it's going to go fast. You don't care if you have a little faceting here, you're not after the fine detail of your, your stress. If you get a little stress concentration that shows up, eh, maybe you'll run it fine later. So, coarse meshes are for quick work. Now, in a, in a perfect world, we'd have fine mesh everywhere, right? What's the problem with that? It means that our studies are huge. If you don't have a particularly powerful computer, uh, you know, this can get you in trouble because you'll have a massive study to solve. So what do we do? Well, we do mesh controls. Uh, in the old days, you had to actually go in and hand, you know, enter, go to a certain area, look at your mesh and add a node and add another node and make sure the node connected properly. That's all great because it's really granular, granular work you can do. But in SOLIDWORKS simulation for years, we've been able to just work off of entities, an edge, a face. So a mesh control will only put detail where you tell it to. So what you do, remember right click, you right click mesh folder, there's an option, apply mesh control. Next thing you do is you choose your entities. Here I've chosen the bearing face of this hole where a preloaded bolt head will push on it. So you can choose the face. Now you can also use edges and vertices. Edges, big deal. Yeah, that's really important. Vertis, vertex, that is just a fancy word for a corner. Now the next thing you do is you specify the size. Here I am specifying a, 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 specifying a size of, of a 
a quarter of a millimeter on that face. So that'll put a lot of elements in between the inner circle and the outer circle. Now you can also use the slider if you like, but when I'm doing a mesh control, I tend to want to just tell it exactly what size to make the mesh in there. So the result is like this. So here's a mesh control added in a mesh model, right? So I only have detail where I need it on that bearing face. And you can even see that the mesh increases gradually in size and you have control over the rate at which it increases there. But the mesh everywhere else is coarse. So you're not wasting computer resources where you don't need them. It prevents a bloated study size by adding many small elements, elements only where you need them and not adding them anywhere else, right? Nice, yeah, that's what I said when I first saw it. And I live and die by this thing. Mesh controls, mesh controls are your friend. Now, how do we mesh? So this is like, what is the procedure for meshing? What do you do? Okay, so first of all, I'm gonna throw it out there. Anybody have a suggestion for how you start your mesh? Well, how about right-clicking the mesh folder? Hey, all right. Next thing, you look in the dropdown and yep, create mesh, there you go. You get a dialog that pops up. And the first thing that you wanna pay attention to is the course defined slider. All right, now SolidWorks is really good at figuring out default mesh size based upon the maximum dimension of your model. Um, I find it works pretty well. More often than not, when I do my first run on a study, I'll just leave it in the middle. Unless I'm particularly worried about my study being massive, I will just leave it in the middle and go. At this point, I might just go right ahead and do it. Now my default is set to always use a certain, you know, a certain type of measure, but we'll come to that in a moment. Also, if you don't like using the slider, because the slider will, will make your mesh twice as fine or make your mesh twice as coarse in terms of the size uh, as you drag it from one end to the other, but you can actually exceed that range by hand entering your minimum and maximum mesh sizes. All right, those are like element sizes that you're specifying. So you can enter those by hand. Mesh parameters, choose your measure. This is where we're talking about the measures that are available in simulation. Standard measure has been available from the beginning. It works fine. I don't use it anymore. The reason I don't use it anymore is because a curvature based measure is, well, to be blunt, it's just better. Uh, the curvature based measure will actually account for small geometry and make the mesh smaller in those regions. Let's say you have you know, a two millimeter fillet on a, on a tabletop sized part. It'll put smaller elements in that fillet area. So I use the curvature based measure all the time uh, for almost everything. The blended curvature based measure, the one sitting at the bottom, that's newer. I think it's been in simulation for about three or four years. And that is something that is recommended to be used when you're having a particularly thorny model that refuses to mesh successfully. Uh, you can use the blended curvature based mesh and the result will take a little longer to mesh. It might wind up with a mesh that takes a little longer to solve, but you know, when you're in trouble, uh, sometimes you might use that. I don't find I need to use a curvature based mesh very often. So I use I mean, the uh, blended curvature based mesh very often. So I use this guy, the curvature based mesh, just by default almost all the time. Now, what about how good your mesh is? Okay, how do you tell? So the first thing that I use, and I, uh, there are two things I'm going to tell you about here. The first one is the mesh quality plot. Um, the mesh quality plot is really your friend. And if you're ever in doubt, just go take a look at it, right? So you right click the mesh folder and you choose this option, create mesh quality plot. Now here's where the rubber starts meeting the road. You wanna choose an aspect ratio plot. The aspect ratio of your elements is a measure of how skinny they are. And it's the longest dimension in your element divided by the smallest dimension. So we generally like to have an aspect ratio under 20, that's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, there are places where you can tolerate it being higher, but generally that's going to only be in regions that are large and expansive, typically not high stress regions, in the middle of a large plate, for example, or somewhere away from where the loads and forces are, or the restraints. Um, if, you're not, if you don't need a whole lot of detail, if you're not concerned about the, the accuracy in a particular area, you can tolerate aspect ratios higher than 20. Uh, but it's a judgment call. Now, here you can see there's a maximum aspect ratio of 26, and it is in a region where we have some fillets and it's making some skinny flat elements. So that might be a, if you're concerned about that, if you expect the stresses might be high there, that might be a good um, motivation for applying a mesh control somewhere in that area. Another thing we can do, and which I always do, it's my habit, every time I mesh, I right click my mesh folder when it's meshed and I check the details. And it brings me up a nice little dialogue 
that gives me lots of good information about my mesh. All right, I will. I want to know what's happening. First of all, those are the sizes, element sizes that I enter. It'll tell me whether I, you know, what mesher I use, the curvature-based mesh, high-quality or draft-quality mesh. How many nodes do I have? How many elements do I have? And one of the interesting things about those two numbers is when you do a high-quality mesh and you leave the, the settings the same, the number of elements will be the same, but the number of nodes goes up. With the draft-quality mesh, the number of nodes will go down and the number of elements still will stay the same. Now, look at this next one here. This is good info to know. Um, Palm to forehead, eyebrows raised. Uh, maximum aspect ratio is 268. Wow, that's pretty high. So this tells me, you know, maybe I want to go look at that aspect ratio plot. Maybe I'll be going and putting in a mesh control to reduce the aspect ratio in some critical areas. So, you know, this is good information to see in, in a one-stop table. Here we see the percentage of elements with an aspect ratio over 10. And uh, also at the bottom, it'll show you how long it took to mesh it. So <clears throat> failed meshes. What happens? Your mesh fails. You mesh it. This is <clears throat> this is what really makes everybody say, ah, you know, simulation, it just it doesn't work for me, right? Oh no, the mesh failed. But what happens when it fails? The mesh failure diagnostics panel will pop up. What do you do? You choose mesh failure diagnostics. Go there. Just do it. <clears throat> this will show you the components that have failed. You select from the list of failed bodies, you select one of them, it'll point to it. It'll basically highlight it blue. So this will give you an idea of what elements are causing the problem. So what do I do? Well, the first thing is you'd apply a mesh control. Now you can apply the mesh control to the body. You can apply a mesh control to some features after you've looked at the body and you figure, oh yeah, there's a sliver surface, there's a really fine fillet, there's something like that. You might do something. You might defeature that part. You might, who knows what you might do. Putting a mesh control is a good way to tell the mesh to be finer there and it'll more likely mesh. Another thing also in the dialog for the mesh control, there's a checkbox staring you in the face for incompatible mesh. I won't go into detail what that means right now, but what I will tell you is that it'll take a little longer to mesh, maybe a little longer to solve, but it will get your mesh done for you. I find incompatible mesh to be a useful tool. So mesh controls, possibly check the box for incompatible mesh. That's a good thing. Contacts. Contact conditions determine how parts touch each other or don't touch each other and how they behave. I call it the rules for social distancing. That's a joke. You're supposed to laugh. Okay, or at least a polite titter from the audience. Okay, so every study, when you create a brand new study, there's a default global component contact, and that is bonded by default on, a, uh, on an unmodified SOLIDWORKS simulation installation. So what that means is that by default, any components that are touching each other will be glued together with an infinitely strong glue. All right, you know, that may or may not be realistic. Now you can override that with more granular contact conditions. For example, a component contact chooses a couple of components or, or maybe more than two, and it defines the contact conditions between those components. Maybe they're no penetration. Maybe they're going to be you know, bonded, maybe they're gonna be a shrink fit or a virtual wall, who knows? So between multiple bodies, there's component contacts. Even more granular than that is a contact set. So a contact set is more specific and it deals specifically with certain entities. This is a really good example of a shank of a bolt and the inside cylindrical surface of the hole. And we don't want that bolt to be able to pass through the walls of the hole, right? So we would probably define a no penetration contact with the bolt shank in one group of, of faces and the, uh, the insides of the hole in another group of faces. We also can use edges and vertices. The vertices are a fancy name for corners. So edges, I use edges all the time with contact sets. That's really valuable. So the most used contact types, these are the types you'll see in a list when you set up a contact set. The most used contact types are no penetration and bonded. So no penetration means that the nodes from one entity cannot pass through the nodes of the other entity, but they can pull apart. So if you've got a piece of sheet metal that's bowing up when it's being torqued, it can pull away from what it's touching. And bonded basically means glued. All right. So that's my story on contact conditions. Well, that brings me to the next topic of when do I have to remesh? If you ever see 
this little emblem, this means you've meshed it before, but the mesh is out of date now. So what would cause that to happen? What would cause you to need to remesh the model? Change the geometry. This one's pretty obvious, right? I mean, the mesh represents the geometry. If the geometry is different, the mesh has to be different. Okay, we're not going to worry so much about that. When everybody expects to make a geometric change, they know they're going to have to remesh. Change context, though, that's not quite so obvious. So why does that happen? Well, the meshes account for the contact conditions. So to put it really simply, uh, the nodes talk to each other equation-wise. So you might have one node that's talking to three or four other nodes on the other part. So if you add a new contact set, or you edit an existing contact set, or you delete a contact set, or you change the global contact, you redefine it, then your mesh is out of date. So it might be a very minor change, but as far as simulation is concerned, all bets are off, you need to re-mesh. Now, on the other hand, there are some things you can do, changes you can make that don't affect the mesh. So if you add a new fixture, if you delete one, add or delete a load, edit a load, go to the material for one part and change it, that does not affect the geometry, does it? It also doesn't affect the nodes and the contact conditions. So if you add, a, you know, you go to a hole and you say, yeah, you're a fixed hole, a uh, mounting hole, let's say, uh, you haven't done anything that requires a remesh. So you get a free pass on those. But the, the, real, the real bottom line is, you know, if the mesh is out of date and you go to run your study, it's just going to mesh it again. You just might not have expected it, all right? Me, as I said before, I like to get my mesh completed. I like to see that green check on the mesh folder. All right, so that's my story on meshing. So we've worked our way down the tree from parts to connections, to fixtures, to forces and loads, and to the mesh. And now we're down at the bottom of running the study, right? So how do you run your study? Anybody have an idea? Hands up, right? Yeah, right click the top feature of your study that's the name of your study static one in this case and hit the run button now if it's a really fast running study you're not going to get a chance to do this because the study will run and this dialog will go away but i always like to hit the more button if i expect it to run for you know more than a few seconds because i get this panel here an expanded panel and it shows me all kinds of information so rather than just sitting there watching the paint dry i can actually kind of see what's happening um i can see the progress of, of the uh, study i can see how much time it's been running since the solver started it will give me messages and these do change as you watch a study work uh, of what it's doing at the moment and my favorite thing that i always look at is my degrees of freedom so 40,000 degrees of freedom means it's solving 40,000 equations in 40,000 unknowns now if you think that's a lot that's a small study you could probably run something like that on a microsoft surface or something like that two million degrees of freedom that's a big study Forty thousand. that's a small study just good information now lastly this panel this run panel will also tell you what solver is being used now it might be a solver that you chose or if you leave it on automatic which actually i do most of the time uh, it'll just tell you what solver is being used at the moment and it'll give you any special meshes like here you know a more accurate slower border bonding surface to surface contact all right once your study has run, you will get three default color chart plots. And those plots are a stress plot, a deformation plot, and a strain plot. Now, if you need to add more plots, if you want to know like what the Y deformation is or what the Y strain or the X strain is, whatever like that, um, what are you going to do? Let's all say together. We're going to right click the results folder. There we go. And that will give you a little drop down menu and you can then pick one of these plot types and then you'll be up to your knees in the ability to define specifically what kind of plot you want and how it's going to be created so that gives you a lot of control right in there we're going to be going into that by the way on the fifth lesson where we talk about results and i'll show you a lot of tricks about that but that's like you know four or five six weeks away okay well that's my basic story on uh, running through the workflow and on meshing. So I'm going to give you an example here, do an example study for you. We've got a uh, flange and a yoke, and they support a purchased cage part. Now, the purchased cage, we can't do anything about, right? It's a, uh, it, it, it is what it is. It's like buying a motor. Now, a downward force is going to be applied on the mounting hole on the cage, and a vertical torque is going to be applied to that mounting hole also. Now, 
because we can't do anything about that cage. And you know, it's kind of complex and ugly anyway. Uh, I'm going to exclude it from the study. So you simply right click on it in your parts folder and exclude from study. And uh, it will be removed from the study. And then I will uh, be showing you that we have a remote load applied at the location where the hole is and a torque. And remember, torques are movable. Torque will be applied to the yoke. Now, all these will be uh, attached to the surfaces that contact that part. So the remote load is going to be attached to these faces here, and the torque will be attached to some of the faces up here, where it would be twisting the model. We'll also be using some bolt connectors, not only to bolt the flange to the plate, but to bolt the yoke to the uh, boss on the flange. So let's go to the example, and I'm going to kind of work through a study setup. So here's my model in SOLIDWORK simulation. First of all, you're going to see that if I go to the add-ins tab, we have simulation added in. Step one, right? Um, if you are in the uh, model tree, your ribbon will look like this. No, the thing I use the ribbon for most often is to create myself a new study. So I'm just going to make a new study here, go alongside my other studies. So I'm going to call this uh, you know, test X. Uh, Spell with capital letters. There we go. Let's test X. And it shows up down at the bottom. Now, the type of study it is, let me just go in there one time real quick. I kind of glossed over this quickly, is a static test. Now, if you don't have any of the advanced packages, you don't have Sim Professional or Sim Premium, these options will not be here. And basically, you'll be able to do a static study. All right. So my study is down here on these tabs, just like Excel worksheets. And here's my new, my new study. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just show you my right-click method. So there's my study. I can right-click the study itself. There are a lot of options for things that we can do here. I'm not going to go into all these details because really what we're showing here is something that would fit into about a day and a half of the first three days of our regular SOLIDWORKS simulation training. So we don't quite have the time for that. The parts folder has several parts in it. It's got a green check. What that means is that the material that was defined in the model all the materials on these bodies uh, is has come through in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So that's one of the nice things about working with a simulation tool that is native to your CAD modeling tool is that you can define your materials in the uh, in the modeler. Now, this guy here, notice the nice interactivity between SOLIDWORKS uh, graphics area and the, the, the tree. So this part I don't want to keep in the study, so I'm simply going to right click on it. And one of the options I have is exclude from analysis. Boom, you're gone. So typically, you know, in the past, years ago, we used to have to make a special study configuration when that component was suppressed. Uh, now we don't have to do that anymore. You just say exclude from analysis. It hides it from view and it's not in there. You can see that it's grayed out here. Good. Uh, the other items know what material they're made out of. This solid body here, that came in as a shell. If you look at that little icon there, on the left, you'll see that it's a shell icon as opposed to these guys, which are chunky icons, they're solid. All right, now I can collapse my uh, parts folder with this little button here, or, you know, the Shift C command that you use to collapse your uh, feature tree and your component tree and parts and assemblies, that now in 2020 works in a simulation study. Yeah, that was a good enhancement, you bet. Okay, let's look at connections here. So you can see here under the component context, there's our global bonded with incompatible mesh contact. All right, so that's the global for everything. Now, we only have two places where these components contact each other. Uh, I'm going to save a little time, and I'm going to go to a study that I have uh, over here that's set up in advance. And there are a couple of contacts in there. I've got a contact between the uh, bottom of the flange on the top of the plate. So I'm just going to take that contact set. I'm going to drag it over. All right. And you'll see now that that contact set is here. So boy, it's really nice to know you can just drag those and copy them just like that. We also have connectors. We have two different bolt groups. I'm going to simply select those with the control key and I'm going to drag those into the new study. Now I'm not going to do this for the whole thing. This is not just a, a drag and drop of canned items, but I want to show you the convenience of being able to reuse items in one study that you set up uh, in another study. So contact sets, we also, now that we have that contact set in here, I'm going to manually walk you through setting up a contact set 
identical to the previous one, <coughs> pardon me, but that, that uh, impacts the surfaces where the yolk meets the boss of the flange. So I'm gonna simply right click the contact set folder and I have contact set option. Again, get it wrong, click something else, right click this guy, you can still find contact set option. And here's my dialogue. So yes, I'm gonna set up from this list a no penetration contact. The first face I'm gonna select is the underside of the yoke. I'm gonna jump and light up the second box. Don't forget to light that up. You gotta make sure you're putting these faces in these two separate boxes. And I'm gonna go and right click over here and use select other. Now in an assembly, this works really well with exploded views. You can explode your componentry so that uh, all the faces are showing and sometimes people do that and it makes life a little easier. But using the uh, select other tool in SolidWorks simulation, works really nicely. So I'm gonna right click a few of these faces to make them go away. And then I left click where the circular face will be. And just to double check, I like to select the two items in their blue boxes. You'll notice this one is color coded blue, it's blue here, this one is color coded pink, and it's pink, so that kind of tells you what's going on. My faces are selected, I am gonna add friction. They both, both contact sets are gonna have a good, healthy, hefty a coefficient of friction of about 0.3. So uh, if you think that's a little high, you know, ding me for it, that's okay. So my contact sets are set up. Uh, I have two bolt groups with virtual bolt connectors in them, and you notice this group up here only has three. So there are four holes in the flange, right? And you can see as I select them, the different holes light up, and I'm gonna add one more and make it identical to the other one. So I'm gonna right click, bolt group, and I'm gonna add a bolt connector. Again, I could right click a whole connections folder and add a bolt connector. It's very forgiving, the same menu shows up anything in that folder. Several different types of bolts you can use. I'm gonna simply uh, use a standard or counter bore with nut. I'm gonna use the first box. You know, you hover over these boxes, it tells you what they want. Circular edge of the bolt head hole. All right, let me go in here where I can see them both, all right? I will select that edge. What's the next thing it wants? Circular edge of the bolt nut hole. Well, well, that'll be the bottom one, right? So I'll click on that guy. Great. I'm going to define a preload for this one. All right, now I'm gonna change the units on my preload. I'm gonna use uh, metric units so I can enter it in kilogram force. Now you can add a torque and the torque will preload it, but I never know what that actual tension is. So my preference is very strongly to use an axial uh, preload. Now, an axial preload, I may get it wrong, but at least I know what it is. So we're going to use 500 kilogram force, and that's going to be my preload, and I'm going to stick with it. You have control over the type of material. You can select a material. You have other parameters that you can control manually if you like, but we're going to skip that for now because we're not going into this in super great detail. Now I have my fourth uh, bolt connector and I'm gonna drag it into that bolt group one folder. There it is, number four. And it's the only one that's showing, you can see here that it's not hidden. So I'll simply right click and hide it. You like the idea that I'm working everything off of the right click? Now, wait a minute, didn't I say I can collapse this using shift C? Good, all right. So far, so good. I've got uh, my parts, all my materials defined, my shell is defined automatically for the sheet metal body. Connections are done. Next, I'm going to go to, go to fixtures. Now, fixtures, uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail here with fixtures. That's going to be the next lesson. So I'm just going to go past the fixtures advisor, and I'm going to just choose fixed geometry. Now, SOLIDWORKS has become very flexible on shell definitions. And in the old days, you had to actually pick an edge, and you had to pick the right edge that was used to define your shell. In the past several years, it's been like, nah. Don't worry about it. Just go pick that thickness edge and you're gonna be fine. So that's made it really easy. I'm not gonna go into the difference between fixed and immovable. That's for the next lesson. Um, that's my fixture and I'm sticking to it. I can hide it if I find it bothersome. I'll right click the fixtures folder and simply hide all of them. Now, next we've got loads. Again, I'm not gonna go into super great detail on the loads. So I'm gonna take the entire external loads folder from this guy drag it here and then I'm gonna just tell you what we've got. All right, so now this guy has got the lo same loads that the other study has. There's a torque of, of 1,382 kilogram force centimeters applied to these three faces here and the same three faces on the opposite side. 
And then there's a remote load. Let me click on this guy and I want to just show it so you can see it. So a coordinate system has been defined for where the load lives and the services it applies to are these guys, the two cylindrical faces that that uh, cage component sits in. All right. So that's an approximation of reality. You could make an argument that I could be you know, more detailed about it, less detailed, but for, for the moment, bear with me. We'll just leave it like that. So we got a force of 200 kilograms pointing uh, downward. So those are my forces. Now, let's deal with the mesh. Let me hide my external loads first. Right click, hide all, right click everywhere, right? Uh, now it's time to mesh this thing. So I'm gonna do that by, remember what we do? Somebody say, right click the mesh folder, click create mesh. All right, so this is the mesh dialog. You got the slider, slides left and right. You can you know, bring it to one end, you can reset it. Um, mesh parameters, that's where we chose the mesher, right? And there's my curvature based mesher selected. Just gonna leave the default settings. I don't see any reason to do anything else. Under the advanced section, high quality, draft quality, of these Jacobian points, I can tell you exactly how many times I've had to change that in my 15 years, 17 years of using SolidWorks, zero. I have never had to work with that. It, it's just, a, it's, it's a function that's left over from the old days. So I'm gonna just choose this and mesh it. Hit the green check, it takes a few seconds and it meshes up, it gives me the mesh progress. All right, good, there we go. Now. One of the things to know that this piece of sheet metal here, this is just a section of the plate that the whole thing is mounted to. I turn it over, you can see it's infinitely thin and it's got a top side and a bottom side. All right, the bottom side is orange. Well, that's good to know. Now, we've already established the contact conditions so the fact that there's a little gap in here shouldn't bother you. you. You can be comfortable with that. All right, you see when I hover over it, it shows me the actual thickness, the virtual thickness. So be comfortable with that, that's all right. Now we look at the mesh. You can see that the curvature base mesher has generated a finer mesh around these curves, did pretty well. Let's look in here, I like this one now. Um, now I know, and you know, if you have a preloaded bolt and you're gonna be stressing your part, we're expecting some high stresses in here. And if I look at these elements, they look kind of skinny. Well, well wait a minute, how skinny? Um, let's go take a look at a mesh quality plot. So I right click the mesh folder. I run down here until I find create mesh quality plot and then I choose it. The dialog comes up. You all remember what my choice is. I want an aspect ratio plot. Let's take a look. All right. Now, you know, remember I said we like our aspect ratio to be under 20 and this is pretty good. This is telling me, uh, Ben, you've got a good mesh. But I am a little concerned when I look at this because I'm seeing higher aspect ratios around the edges of the hole. Now, that's a sharp corner. We call that a sharp re-entrant corner. It's an interior corner. That's where stresses tend to get magnified, called stress concentration. So when you have interior corners, especially when you know it's going to be stressed, when you know that that preloaded bolt is pulling on it and it's going to be resisting the torques and forces that are applied, I want to get a little more accuracy on that. I'm just not comfortable with that. As a result of that, I'm going to hide my mesh control plot and I'm going to, uh, excuse me, my mesh quality plot and I'm going to add a mesh control to the outer edges of these faces. I'm not going to do it to the faces like in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. So I right click the mesh folder. I know I keep looking at that little stupid red arrow of mine coming in saying right click, right? And then I'm going to go down here and apply mesh control. All right, so what am I going to apply it to? It says faces, edges, or vertices, or reference points or components for mesh control. <clears throat> All right, so let me go in here. I'll pick these edges. Remember your cursor highlights and tells you what you're about to pick, an edge or a face. And I pick on this edge and I pick on this edge. And I will define this uh, to be a very fine mesh. Now, that's about a 15 uh, millimeter uh, diameter uh, edge. And this one here is nine. So six millimeter diametral difference, three millimeters radial. I want to get about four elements in there. So I'm gonna set this to be about 0.7 millimeters. All right, that should allow for about four layers in there. Now I'm gonna right click the mesh folder. Notice how the mesh is out of date. Why? Because I added a mesh control to it. Now it tells me, well, you have to mesh, you've got to remesh. So I'll create mesh 
Leave everything else the same, hit the green check, and it'll mesh again. What you're going to see is much more regular looking elements in there. Well, let's check the acid test here, how it really works. Right click and show the mesh quality plot. Now look, our actual highest version, our maximum, uh, has been changed. Give me a moment here. Let me uh, get to screen. Uh, it's now, instead of 11, it's 8. So it's actually improved everything. So some of my high aspect ratio elements had been in here. And now what you're seeing is nice, chunky elements with low aspect ratios, of, you know, three or four. So that's a good thing. So I expect to get more accuracy and less a mesh created stress concentrations. So the next step would be to run, I would simply write, well, actually, here's the real thing. The next step is to save your model, right? Good, all right. Uh, so what I would do is I would right click and say run. Now, I've run this already. Uh, already, but I'm going to jump over to this study, which is complete. So this is like in a cooking show where the guy says, and now you just take your roast and you put it in the oven for three hours. And I happen to have one right here in the next oven. So this one is done. Um, one other thing I will do for you here is I'm going to right click the mesh folder. I just, just forgot in the previous example. I'm going to right click the mesh folder and show you the details to show you the dialogue here. Now, in this particular example, I have got uh, a mixed mesh, so it doesn't give me details like what the highest aspect ratio is in this particular table. But it will tell me how many nodes I've got, 74,000, tell me I've got a high quality mesh, uh, curvature based mesh, et cetera, et cetera. And it took nine seconds to mesh. So, you know, not quite as much information as when you have just one kind of element, but still is valuable information. So I've got a few plots here, and I'll just give you an idea of what went on. First of all, if you right click your results folder, there's a great little thing up here called solver messages. We'll go into this in more detail in the last lesson. And in solver messages, you can see that that study, because of all the context sets and all the bulk connectors, it took 31 minutes to run. So you'd think for a small study, that's a long run time, and it is, but I got the detail I needed in there, and it's wrestling with very short bulk connectors, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives me good detail about the study. It'll also tell me the nodes and the number of elements. Um, let's look at the stress plot. The stress plot was created. I'm simply going to double click it and it will show. Now, the material I'm using has a yield strength. It's a high strength alloy steel, 620 megapascals. Plain carbon steel is at around 210 megapascals. So, if this were plain carbon steel, it would otherwise have pretty much the same material properties. So, your stress plot would look the same but the yield strength wouldn't be quite so high. So this is our highest stress, 168 megapascals, and our yield strength is 620, so we have a factor of safety of about four. Uh, let's take a look at this here. You can see where the stress is highest. Oh, right in there. It's a good thing I put that mesh control in there, wouldn't you say? All right, now, just for future reference, when you see a little bit of triangulation like this in your stress plot, that's an indication you either have a very high stress concentration built into your model, or you probably should just have a finer mesh, one or the other. So that gives you a little bit of information on what it looks like when you're done with your study. Let's do a quick look at the displacement plot here. Double click on that guy. And you can see our maximum displacement is about uh, a third of a milliliter. And this is a linear study. So that's basically due to the torque and the force that was applied on it. So that's my story on this study. So let's now head back to the PowerPoint and uh, we'll continue. So I wanna pause for a moment and show you what the uh, upcoming remaining uh, webinars are. Again, on June 2nd, we've got restraints and fixtures. I'll be showing you some of my own little uh, practical workshop tips on how to, some things I like to do. Uh, applied forces and loads, that's gonna be on the 18th of June materials and a few uh, random practical tips that I think will uh, you'll find valuable. Understanding your results, working with those plots, working with like bolt and pin forces, that sort of thing. There's a lot you can actually do with that to make your results clearer. So I want to thank you for coming. We really do appreciate your business, especially 
in uh, times of this pandemic. It really uh, matters to us, and our job is to serve you and make sure that your world uh, is working as, as well as it can be. We really appreciate the fact that you all are still working. I'm thankful you're still working. I'm thankful I'm still working. So thank you very much. 